Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kathke and in today's video I'm going to give you a quick introduction to a really cool nice tool called DuckDB using Python. This is a tool to help you scale your analytics and data analysis. Where are we going? I'm going to start by talking about what is DuckDB, why use DuckDB, the challenges, and a riveting demo. So what is DuckDB? It's a database that runs in process like SQLite. In fact, the people who developed DuckDB used SQLite as a sort of model for how they should build DuckDB. It does not, however, use a row store type of format, which typically relational databases use. It uses a column store format. What's the difference, Brian? Why do I care? Because the row store format basically stores everything as entire rows of data. So all the columns for a row across and then every row has its own sort of storage and so it's very orientated that way and that's ideal for data maintenance insert update and delete but it's not great for querying data because very often you're selecting only certain columns also column store compresses so it tries to squeeze as much data as possible in the least space and that's not necessarily true in relational database storage like SQLite it saves tables inside of a flat file which is on your local system or you can just work in memory in SQLite, you actually have to sort of say open the connection and then tell it you want it to be in memory. This is something that is ubiquitous when you're using DuckDB, as we'll see. It provides a database service and a full SQL interface. What does that mean? It means that not only can you use Python and interact with DuckDB, but it also includes its own SQL shell that you can submit just SQL statements however you want. It's a very rich version of SQL. You can even use something like dBeaver, which allows you to connect and using the dBeaver SQL user interface. You can then query DuckDB using SQL and you can do all your analysis right there in that way if you want. But of course, we're here to talk about Python, so we're not gonna do that. Another way to look at DuckDB is think of Power BI and if you're familiar with that, then you know under the covers, the desktop version of Power BI uses something called the tabular model and it's a local flat file that stores your data in a column store format and then Power BI slices and dices very quickly, right? click speed to give you your visualizations. So it's very similar to that, except that DuckDB is open source, very liberal licensing as we'll see, but similarly in that kind of concept. And you can see the duckdb.org documentation. I recently did a video in which I talk about ways to extend data analysis beyond pandas, and I'll put a link in the description so you can go back to that. But this should also be in a playlist that will include that original video that kind of launched this. So let's talk about the range of data volume because we kind of went from zero to hero. Right? So let's talk about the range of data volumes. So if we look at the full gamut, it all started with small little data sets that R could easily handle all in memory, not a problem. And Python, using pandas, could also handle small data sets without a problem. It works, it's great. When I say small data sets, this is not a lot of volume, but that was okay for quite a while. Then along came medium data sets. They're a little bigger, quite a bit bigger in many cases. Medium data sets are things that can not easily be handled in the memory of a single machine. And you can think of medium data set sizes as typically what you would see in a relational database backend server. Although a backend server like Oracle or SQL Server can handle pretty large volumes, but it's still similar in concept because typically these servers are single machine. And then you get to the big data world that became all the rage in the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. And suddenly it's just massive, massive amounts of data. How much data are we talking? Well, in the small data sets world, and I'm just kind of throwing out rough numbers here, but think of a few megabytes, you know, you get a few megabytes, maybe a few thousand rows, you're slicing and dicing and it's fine. You know, your machine can handle it. Get to the medium data set world. We're talking maybe greater than 16 gigabytes, which is oftentimes the memory limit of a machine to something under a terabyte, right? Because typically in the medium data set world, if you get beyond a terabyte, it's going to be very difficult for that one machine, even if it can page data in and out. It's going to get difficult for that one machine to handle it. Now, I think in DuckDB's case, you can probably go beyond the one terabyte range to several terabytes. Depends on your machine, but it's so efficient at handling it that you're going to be able to handle a lot of these even larger medium data sets. Then you get to the petabytes world, right? That's big data. Petabytes is beyond any single machine. I don't think many people will argue that. Even my machine, <laughs> which is pretty beefed up, isn't going to handle a petabyte. So kind of going back, small data sets easily handled by one machine, probably could handle it on my iPhone. Medium data sets, one machine's probably not going to fit it all into memory though, but one machine could do it as long as the service you're using, aka DuckDB, or even SQLite can page things in and out so that it doesn't crash if it doesn't fit into memory. Spoiler alert, Pandas data frames must fit in memory. 
So if you only have 16 gigabytes available and you try to go beyond that, you just crash your system. Same thing with our data frames. So you, you run into a problem there. SQLite can get beyond that. Even Polars, from what I understand, Polars, which is sort of a faster version of Pandas, cannot scale beyond the memory in the machine because it's still trying to fit the data frame inside the memory of the machine all at once. And finally, when you get to big data, think of SPAC or Dask or one of those types of frameworks that can scale out to multiple machines and therefore it can break up the data into chunks and then process them in parallel. So these big data tools are definitely what you need if you have the volume of data, but you don't always have that. And it becomes kind of this weird thing. You go from these small data sets and suddenly when you get beyond what you have on your own machine for memory, you've got to go to something like Apache Spark, which is not a trivial exercise. And maybe you're just trying to get your work done and you just need something that will get you over the hump. So sometimes going to Databricks and Spark is really overkill. So ta-da, DuckDB to the rescue. Let's quack for them because DuckDB is designed to service their sweet spot here, which is the medium range of data, which can be a lot of data all scrunched into a machine. It's very efficient, very fast. Fast. The one thing I want you to take away from this, though, is that DuckDB does not scale to multiple machines. It must work on a single machine. It's going to storage data in a file on your local file system. So it is not something that will be competing with engines like Snowflake or Spark. So look at this diagram. You get kind of a sense of how this works, right? On the left, you see external data. It could be anywhere. It could be external files, could be relational databases, could be something out on the internet. And you want to take this and import the data and put it into a local storage system. Now with SQLite, you could typically do this and SQLite, as I mentioned, can also scale pretty well and handle the volume no matter how big. But then once you get it into the local file storage, that's your database locally. Now you can pull it out or just continue if you've just kept it in memory as well. Do your data analysis, do your machine learning, and you're good to go. Now, I like the idea that you're physically storing it because that means if you had to bring in like a lot of data, you're not going to be waiting every time to reload it. You can store it locally in its column store compressed format. And you'll notice here, C colon backslash data slash my duck DB dot DB. So in other words, that is kind of emphasizing this is just a flat file on your system. Not much different than an access database, which is also just a flat file or SQLite. One thing I will also call attention to, although I put .db at the end, there really is no fixed requirement for what the extension should be. But the idea here is we want to import the data, put it into a the local .db database, and then do our work. In my demo, I'm going to walk through doing this because what I also want to accomplish in this is the idea that we can bring in and process data that exceeds the capability of our machine. In other words, exceeds the memory on our machine. So we're not able to load it all into a pandas data frame. And that gets us to why use DuckDB? It's very fast, especially for large data sets, meaning the medium large data sets that can scrunch into with sort of paging in and out can be scrunched into a single machine, not petabytes, but probably in the multiple terabytes range wouldn't be a problem in most cases. And that gets us back to it handles data that does not fit into the machine's memory. This has always been an issue with R and Pandas data frames. They're great. You can slice and dice really great APIs, but you're limited to the machine's memory. And nowadays, that's just not good enough for many use cases. Now, what I really like about DuckDB is that it's really easy to install. It's a single file kind of install, no dependencies. DuckDB is written in C, so it's, it's super fast. And of course, because it's written in C, it integrates very easily with Python, which is also written in C. DuckDB is free. Just grab it, install it, and have a good time. It's open source, and it uses the MIT licensing, which allows people to even make products out of it and make a lot of money if they want without paying for it. It has full SQL language support, which is really nice. It's not some reduced instruction set of SQL. It's the full-blown thing you can use, with the exception of the kind of SQL commands that have to do with security, like grants and things, because it's going to be somewhat limited there because it's a flat file, right? It's not sitting disconnected on some server in the back end somewhere. This is just a file on your machine. So if somebody has to file, well, it's kind of hard to do much with grants to protect it, right? So, but it has a very rich select kind of focused expressive language, and it does support CRUD operations, create, update, delete, and ACID transactions around that. A nice thing also is DuckDB supports many languages, and it can even run standalone. I mentioned you can use, for instance, dBeaver, which is a user interface that supports many different types of database backends, or you can just go directly into the DuckDB prompt and start typing SQL statements there. So you could do all your analysis without even using Python if you like, but of course that's not what we wanna do, right? We wanna use Python. So let's talk about learning challenges and then we're gonna get into my riveting demo. I thought when I first saw DuckDB, you saw Mother Duck, I believe that's a company that 
came up with DuckDB. They do most of the videos and training I've seen on it, and they kind of gloss over, you know, it's a sales pitch. Oh, it's great. It does everything. And at first you're like, wow, this is great. But almost every instance of what I saw is they take data and first put it into a pandas data frame. And then we load it into or whatever with DuckDB, which to me kind of sells it short of what you're really looking for, which is being able to handle that larger volume of data. So I jumped in thinking, I'm going to be able to do this in two seconds. I'll figure it out. No problem. Just like SQLite. Well, not really. DuckDB has a more extensive vision ahead of itself. And as such, it has a bunch of different APIs and they're not always clearly distinguished from each other. Like where does one begin and one end? In particular, I found it a little bit confusing between the Python API, the Python library, if you will, and the SQL API. Many times I'm saying, can I do this type of query, that type of query, and I ended up on the SQL API documentation, which is just SQL as if you typed it into a regular user interface or at the SQL prompt. But I'm not, right? I'm working with Python and I'm probably going to try to integrate it with pandas. So it was oftentimes not clear to me how to get a specific SQL statement to work from the Python API. Also, some of the concepts and objects were not immediately intuitive to me. For example, and I will demonstrate this, but I decided very much like when I do pandas, I do some query and I return it to a pandas data frame. But of course, I don't want to return it to a pandas data frame because it might be bigger than I can fit in memory. And pandas isn't the most efficient way to do further analysis. So I decided to try to use the DuckDB method where I query something out of the DuckDB database and return it as a variable. Only I got back what is called a DuckDB relation object. And it wasn't obvious to me how to use that and what the purpose of it was. So I had to do more research, read the documentation, and I discovered there's a lot there. I still have a lot to learn about how to really leverage the relation object, but it was sort of a side API that I wasn't even quite ready for getting into. And finally, DuckDB's documentation is extensive. I compliment them on having elaborate documentation around the SQL API, around the Python API. Unfortunately, because I think not enough people have been using it for very long, there's not a lot of good examples. And I really more am an example learner. Just show me what the code looks like, and then I can tweak it and play with it. And this gets into trouble because many times you need to pass certain parameters to a given function for it to do what you want. For instance, I want to do a SQL statement. I may need to, depending on how I'm trying to execute it, pass in a relation object before I can make the SQL statement with it. And that's just one kind of example, but that's the kind of thing where it can get a little confusing, where if I saw examples of how to call it, it would be a lot easier. So let's get into the demo. I'll be doing this demo from within VS Code but I'm doing a notebook within VS Code. So it's really just a Jupyter notebook. And I will put that out, link in the description. You can go get it for your very own. But I want to kind of review what I'm doing here. It's a very short demo, but it hopefully will convey the right points that you need to know to get into leveraging DuckDB. First thing I want to call your attention to, what, I'm, what my goals are. And this little glove hand here should help you understand what I'm trying to do here. Number one, avoid using pandas data frames to load and query because it won't work when the data is greater than memory. I really wanted to hammer on that first because that to me is the number one use case where you're, you hit a wall. You can't get past it. The data keeps crashing because it's, you know, 50 terabytes and you don't have the room for it. So I wanted to see that first because that's when I would definitely go to something like DuckDB. I also want to take advantage here, take advantage of DuckDB's fast loading abilities. Some of the videos I saw around DuckDB emphasize that DuckDB can pull in data very, very quickly. And doing the same thing in, say, our data frames or pandas could take a long time. So the idea of loading it into pandas first, only then using DuckDB, seems to me very counterintuitive to the very reason I'm going to DuckDB. Finally, I want to directly load external data into a DuckDB database, then query it. Now, I come from the old-fashioned world where we store things in a database and then we can slice and dice and query our heart's content. And so that's kind of the model I like to go with. But also, sometimes if it could take a long time to load data, munge it, join it, and you, want, you get sort of intermediate results, it's really nice to be able to store it somewhere, like in a database, where it can actually understand relationships and connections, and you can just pull it in again later. You don't have to try to track down what did I leave it off at, and also, I don't want to have to reload every time I go to process the data. By default, you can do these things, but by default, DuckDB will make you reload it again. And even though DuckDB is fast, it seems like an unnecessary overhead you don't want to have to incur. Now, pandas is important and it certainly has a place here. So here I'm saying I want to use pandas, but only for results that fit in memory. And generally, I want to keep the size of what I do with pandas kind of small because I don't want to be here all day. So let's step through. First, I need to import the DuckDB package. Now, before I can import it, I need to make sure I install it. To install that, I just need to go and say pip install 
DuckDB. Just say pip install DuckDB and enter and you're good to go. I've already installed it. In fact, you can see here a little quiz for people who may be going for interviews. What does that mean at the beginning? That prefix before my prompt is indicating that I have created a virtual environment. I called it DDBENV. I'll put a link in the description to a riveting video in which I tell you how to use virtual environments. Python virtual environments. Why do I need them, Brian? Why would I care? The reason to use virtual environments is that when you start installing different packages, you end up with a lot of dependencies and you may write code that while it works under a given version of a package, will not work under future versions or older versions. That's a big problem in Python development in general. So a technique people use is to create a virtual environment which serves as a sort of logical, not physical, but a sort of logical container. And once you've created the virtual environment, everything you install is tracked in what's called a requirements file, requirements.txt typically. And you can then use that to recreate the environment with all the exact versions of packages you need to deploy your app or just give it to somebody else so they can recreate your environment. This is a really important part of Python because Python has so many different libraries that interconnect. It can really get to be painful when you try to recreate the environment. Now, a good point about DuckDB is it's a single file that it installs, so it's very easy and you don't have dependencies. Now, I'm not going to reinstall it now, but you get the idea. Do your pip install. And once I've done my pip install, as I already have, I can just run import. And you can see it went really quickly. And notice I imported DuckDB so I can access the DuckDB library through the DuckDB prefix. I didn't use an as prefix or anything, so it's just DuckDB. And I want to do a SQL statement. So I'm going to use a SQL statement that has no tables necessary because I haven't created anything yet. I'll just say select 42 because that's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. And then I'll just say show. And let me try that out. And I'm using Control Enter to run its cells. You can use the mouse if you prefer. And it worked great. And you can see it kind of does a pretty good job displaying it. Not quite as nice as pandas would, but it's pretty good. I like the fact too that it tells you right here that it's an int 32 so you know what the data type is. DuckDB is actually type sensitive. It actually tracks the types which is a nice step up from SQLite which is very loosey-goosey when it comes to types. And you might say, Brian, why don't I have a connection here? I use SQLite. I got to create a connection. Well, what happens when I do this statement this way, it uses what they call the default connection, which is in memory. And it's nice that it does this because then you can just start jumping in and doing things without having to worry about even creating a connection. But because we want to keep the data we import for future use, we're going to create a permanent database file for it. Now, I don't have to reimport DuckDB, but to reinforce that import DuckDB, and I'm going to use that but this time I'm going to use the connect method. So this DuckDB has a bunch of methods hanging off of it. And one of them is connect. And then I just, if you use SQLite, it's identical, right? We just give it the name of a file or a full path with the file specification. So I'm going to create a local file right in my current folder called taxidbdemo.db. Now I've chosen to use the .db extension, but it's not required. I think it's a little bit easier. You might say ddb just to make it clear it's a DuckDB file. And the results from that will be returned to a connection. So you'll have a connection object when you're done. And now since we have the connection, what I want to do is it's going to go in again to this file. I'm going to pass a SQL statement. Now notice I've got triple quotes. Interview question. What does triple quotes mean? Triple quotes are called doc strings. And typically they're used for comments in Python, but they're also used for any time you need a string that's going to exceed a single line. So single line strings, you can just put in single quotes. But when you need a multi-line string, and this is typically the case anytime you're communicating to relational databases, even SQLite, you put it into three quotes and you notice the end three quotes. And here we can make it just really, I did it for legibility. In here now I can put my SQL statement. Now this is pretty cool because I'm going to create or replace a table. I love the fact you got replaced. That's pretty new in databases, by the way. It used to be you just create it or you break. But now you can say create or replace table, taxi underscore data as, and I'm doing a select statement. And this is powerful. I got to say, I like this. I can say read parquet and then just point to a parquet file. Now, Brian, what if it's sitting on the internet or some other place? Wouldn't you be able to read it there? And the answer is yes, you can definitely do those kinds of things. I put it locally, one, because I didn't want to have the overhead of communicating over my Wi-Fi to slow things down, which might give a false sense of how good DuckDB is. So I downloaded this and I'll put a link to the description of where you can get this, but I just downloaded this data set then I'm reading directly from it in my local folder. And it is a good idea to terminate with the semicolon. I don't know if you always need to do that, but certainly if you were passing multiple statements, that's a standard in SQL. So I'm gonna run this. And mind you, that's loaded in a lot of data. It's like millions of rows. I don't remember exactly how many. You can see also it tells us we got a DuckDB connection and it gives us this useless reference, but we got that now. So now that we have that, 
and remember I put it in this table now so it loaded this data into this table I like the fact too that because it's parquet parquet includes its own schema in other words column and data types described so I didn't have to tell it that it automatically created the metadata or the table with the metadata that I needed so now I can use a method called table off my connect object so my connection object table taxi data and off of this there's other methods and one of them is show so I'm going to say show now this is one of the things I found less intuitive I'm used to things like the head statement you can say head and then you just put a number how many rows you want it to show but here you have to name the parameter specifically max rows equal how many so I just want four rows I don't want to see this entire thing let me scroll down you can see it works great and one of the things it tends to do is kind of gives you the first couple of rows then it kind of gives you these dot dot dots and I believe what it's doing then is like a heads heads and tails kind of thing head tails to give you a sample of what the data looks like which is nice and it looks pretty good right this is still not a data frame coming back though this is all DuckDB at this point it's all working through the Python API though and it tells us we've got more than 10,000 rows right 9999 or more than 9999 rows and it's saying we're going to show you just four of those because I asked for four in the show so let's try a little something more interesting we'll say con execute again select asterisk from taxi data and we'll just limit what comes back instead of limiting on the show I'm going to use the SQL limit so it's kind of less overhead on the database and it also ensures that I'll only get back a small set of data and I did that because I want to take the results and I want to show it as a data frame or return it as a data frame so the method I use after the con dot execute is fetch df meaning bring this back as a data frame we have fetch one fetch all and we have fetch df those are the three types and I did that and one of the things you notice because it is really coming back as a data frame it is really you know nice to look at visually right it's a lot nicer than the way things usually display now if I wanted to say instead of here fetch data frame I could also say fetch all and what I'm going to do here is just a, a little more complicated query I'm going to say select vendor ID sum the amount but round it to two decimal places and return the column name as total it's coming from again my table I loaded taxi data and group it by vendor ID all wrapped up in a doc string fetch all now if you notice a few things one is since I'm grouping by vendor ID I only have three one two six are the values for my vendor IDs it's a very small set of data which is why it's okay to say fetch all and you'll notice that it's returning a list so by default this is DuckDB's API this is how it will return the data in this case so it's coming back as a list but within the list are, are tuples right because we see they're wrapped in parentheses so these are tuples wrapped in a list or a list of tuples let's do something a little different now I'm gonna do the same kind of thing before but since I know it's a small set of data I am safe to say fetch data frame and it's just kind of how I would work like I do some sampling testing before I try to load a data frame and lo and behold it came right back and there's our data frame so we can do all kinds of things we can sort we can group we can do whatever we want I'm not really trying to get into the expressiveness of the SQL in DuckDB online you can see it's very extensive I just want to kind of get through the basic bare bones to see how it works so at this point I'm like this is great but I really want to hold on to the data set coming back and not have to keep running queries recreating it so I'm going to say con execute and this is again the connections going back to the database file I created earlier the table is taxi data and I'm going to subset the data to just where the vendor ID is one and now I'm going to pull back a data frame but I'm going to return it to a variable called taxi df1 now of course it didn't do much yet it just has a reference to that but I want to see what is the object coming back because I want to make sure it's really truly a pandas data frame and here we see yep this is really a pandas data frame that duckdb is returning if that's true then I can use some of the APIs I'm used to using pandas data frames and so here I can pass a list of column names within a list that I want to display and you can see of course there's too many to display here so it's telling you in my subset I got a lot of data there and it's not going to bring it all back to my notebook lucky us but it worked great all right that's kind of the basics so we've seen now how to just use the default connection for a little bit but then we jumped in right away saying let's grab a bunch of data throw it into a physical database file and have a table that we can go back to over and over again and query and slice and dice great what about this relation object thing this is something that kind of threw me so I'm gonna go over a little bit too we may use the default connection object duckdb so it's in memory and I can say read parquet and then I can pass it the parquet file name just as we did before only when I do it like this I'm not loading it into a database yet I'm gonna return it as an object which is called a relation and so now I have this taxi underscore rel 
what did I get? What is the object in there? You can see duckdb, duckdb, duckdb pi relation. So it's a an object returned, which is a Python relation within duckdb. Well, that's great, but what can I do with this relation object? That was my question, to be honest. I, I said, great, I got it. And I thought it would be moronically simple, honestly, to just use that relation wherever I don well liked, but it was not so easy to figure it out. However, I did discover through sort of the IntelliSense, like, wow, there's a lot of methods hanging off this thing. That's pretty cool. So my taxi relation dot show, and I have, again, max rows equal two. You can't just put a number in there, but if I run that, I can use it directly, which is pretty cool. Now, mind you, notice how it's displaying. Although it looks pretty cool and works great, this is not a data frame and it's not just like an extra big data frame that DuckDB has given you. It's its own custom object with its own API, its own methods. However, now that I have it, and this sort of I thought was interesting, a little unintuitive to me because I can take that relation and substitute it directly in a disconnected or default connection query here, DuckDB Duck SQL, and it will understand that that's a table, that's an object. So it will treat the relation, which is really outside of my database in theory, but it will treat it as if it is locally, which probably means it did store it into some memory database, but that's pretty cool. And I'm going to, just to show you can say show in a different number of rows, I'll just bring five rows back. That's pretty cool. Now I want to emphasize this again. What are we getting when we do this? Select asterisks from the taxi underscore REL. This is not going back to the database we created at the beginning. This is an in-memory data set, the default connection. And what it's really referencing is this, a relation object that we created here. I want you to really understand that piece though, because that's important. This is a separate object altogether. And we can do cool things. Another method we have, there's a whole bunch. Again, go to the documentation. There's tons of stuff off of this. But something else I can do is just say, I want to do a describe. And this is the statistical kind of describe takes a second because a lot of data in here but it came back in just a little over a second it looks like and we can see that we get the columns that seem to matter it's it pulls out so it says okay here's the vendor id it gives us a count gives us a mean gives us standard deviation a min a max and a median and it does that for the columns where it makes sense if it's a string a lot of this wouldn't make a lot of sense right but for these numeric columns it's pretty cool and you can see where it doesn't have columns to reference it just kind of puts dot dot dots which it's nice because it implies you can kind of intuitively sense, okay, there's more columns there than what I'm seeing. So that's pretty nice, actually. Again, there's a lot of stuff you can do with a relation object. And I have a feeling that as I get more comfortable with DuckDB, I'll probably would do more and more work with the relation object because it looks like I love the idea of having an external object in Python that I can just kind of use when I need it rather than constantly going back to the database file. Now, it's important that we did create a custom connection at the beginning, which is pointing to a physical file. So it's important that we close that connection, just like in SQLite, because I have learned if you do not, you cannot get back to that file, and it ain't pretty. So you want to make sure you run that and close your connection. So wrapping up, we started out by talking about what is DuckDB anyway, and we learned that it's a sort of tabular model, a hypercompressed column store database that runs locally on your own machine. They call it in process. It can really communicate efficiently with Python. Cool stuff. In fact, I was watching a demo, and DuckDB is even aware of the pandas data frames you're creating and you can register them i didn't show you that that's pretty cool and then it can leverage those data frames internally so it's very powerful it's a brilliant idea if you see the people talk about it and they kind of promote it you realize that there's a, a lot of thought that went into this so kudos to them for that and it's open source freely usable even make your own products on it so i'm, I'm excited i love products like that why use it bottom line is it's fast it's really fast and it's just there right if, very quick install takes like a two second install and you got it it can easily handle data sets that are much larger than your machine's memory which is something that is really hard to accomplish with other tools so it's got a lot of great benefits and again you know can't beat the price so why not use it and remember i showed you a diagram with the scale of data right small data sets and then on the other end was really large big data sets this middle space has been sort of lacking for a long time for good solutions to and i think duckdb has stepped up to the plate to solve this problem However, all this being said, there are a few challenges. In other words, don't expect it's going to be so intuitive that you can just jump in and like when you try to put something together without the manual, I'll figure this out. I still have a swing set. I never did figure out how to put together for the kids. So you don't want to do that. Uh, you have to read the documentation. I hope my video can help you in this regard. Don't worry about it. I kind of pointed that out because it's not you. At least I'm stupid too then because I couldn't understand some of this. So don't worry about it. Just be aware that it's worth the challenges. Yeah, it takes a few hours, maybe a little longer because if you're not used to this, but it's worth it because you get some really efficient queries and speed your day up, speed your work up. Well, that's it for this time. So please like, share, subscribe, and until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.